chat with you a little bit. I, I am really excited to be here and I want this to be a conversation back and forth. Maybe not quite as casual as our sports talk beforehand, but you know, feel free to ask me questions. I'll try to give you uh, useful answers. Um, you all have a great thing going here. Let me start out by saying that. Um, this, so this is an old school publication. This is what I like to read. It's got pages, you know, you can hold it up. It's got pictures, even better. But you all probably already know this, but there is a great article uh, in the Gulf Shore Business, the October um, uh, edition about the Rocket Lounge. This is such an outstanding feature for Lee County and Fort Myers and all of Southwest Florida to help attract business, to bring business, to expand business, to give folks, you know, like you, a chance to get to bring an idea into fruition, make it happen. It's exciting. It's really neat. And um, and so, what I want to what I want to do is have a you all take away from this some basic ideas about how to protect yourself um, from from lawsuits and how to put yourself in the best position to deal with a, a potential lawsuit because unfortunately it's sort of like protecting yourself from a common cold. There's only so much you can do and you know sometimes you, you catch a cold. So then how do you battle back against the cold? How do you put yourself in the best position to uh, defeat the cold, have the cold for the shortest time? And so that's kind of where we need to start our thinking in terms of how do you protect yourself from a lawsuit. So why, and then here's the interactive part, so these are not rhetorical questions. So Chris, why are you here today? Um, <clears throat> to get some more ideas, uh, expand my knowledge of how to protect yourself from being sued. Right. I've, I've been sued um, in various contexts uh, and or my family's been sued, so. Okay, so you want So I've, I've understood from different perspectives. You know, I've also sued people, um, reluctantly. Uh, that's, uh, I understand. <laughs> When you're left with no other option. Right. And, um, so, any ideas that I can get there as useful ideas to prevent it or be successful if you prevail. Okay. We can, we'll talk about all that. Yeah, how about you? Um, well, when I read the initial topic, uh, how not to get sued as a startup, I was like, well, that's very interesting for me. I, I just relaunched my consulting practice as of four months ago. Uh, but then, as I sit down here and, and actually see the screen behind you, um, I, I didn't even read it until literally just a second, and, and it, it was very, uh, it was very pertinent because, as Mark and I were speaking earlier, um, it spoke to exactly what I've done in a previous role um, as far as vendor management goes. So I'm anxious to learn if there were things that I could have done better, or if things that I can extract that maybe were best practices and I didn't even know it at the time, uh, and then utilize those for potential future clients. As good, well. good. And one thing that I hope that both of you um, and everyone that's watching takes out of this is, you know, the, the idea behind this is to, to save, you know, time, energy, and, and money, right? You know, the, the idea is, you know, why do you want to... That's the sound of money going down a drain. You can find so much on the internet. So, you know, why, why would you want to put your hard-earned down? Why would you want to put your precious time into a situation when there is uh, no exit strategy for you or protective strategy for you um, to, to move forward. Um, and so to illustrate that, you know, I like to do some, some fun stuff. Um, they say that when you put words on PowerPoint, it's, it's bad, so we're not gonna do that. So we've got, does anyone ever remember the uh, movie Chevy Chase Vacation? It came out in the early 80s. Sure. All right, so. Let me just set this little clip up. So, as you recall, uh, Chevy Chase is taking his family to Wally World in the family truckster. There's a problem when they get to near the Grand Canyon, um, and he has to deal with a, let's just call him service provider. Let's take a look here. So 
you get threatened with a wrench, your bad work, and he's cleaned out. I don't want that to happen to you guys, and so that's a, a humorous illustration. One more illustration. I love movies. It, you know, my wife and I watch a number of movies a week, and I write little reviews about them, and then I kind of take lessons from them. So let's take a look at this one. This is a film from the early 90s. This is called uh, Pacific Heights. You have uh, two folks uh, that were a husband and wife, and they had a, a house that they were going to have to rent underneath their house in, um, in San Francisco. And they did not do their homework. And they ended up with, whoops, went the wrong way, sorry. They did not do their homework, and they ended up with a bad guy. There we go. We'll just watch this real quick, and then we'll move on. doing his homework. We will find the perfect landlords. And now the game begins. I'm on the other side. The Carter case. Melanie Griffith. Matthew Modine. And Michael Keaton. Stay I don't want Michael Keaton showing up at your doorstep, you know, after you've hired him and there's a problem and you've got this sinking feeling. So, how do we deal with that? Plus, he's Batman, you know, Plus that's the other thing. <laughs> he's Batman, that's right. <laughs> okay, so the first thing that we need to do, and, and I think you were talking about this earlier, Dale, is you got to figure out what are you trying to do? You know, when you are considering hiring someone or you're considering entering into a, in some sort of arrangement, it doesn't mean you have to be hiring them. When you're entering into some sort of interaction between your business and someone else that's going to provide something for your business, you know, what is it exactly that you're trying to have that person or other company do? You need to capture that before you go out and hire. Because you need to then identify the right person to provide the service that you are, are looking to have done. Um, and okay, so the words here are my guy. Do you really need to hire out? Is there someone else that's in your business right now that can handle that, that issue? Think about it. If you've hired someone, you've already vetted them. One of the things, Chris, that you were talking about before was the vetting process. Now, you were talking about it in terms of the investment uh, that you will make and that potentially other investors will make, but the vetting process is not limited to that, of course. It's limited, it, it, it expands to everything that you know, comes through our gills, right? So I want to bet whoever is going to work for me, whoever is going to be in my building, whoever is going to gain my trust. If I've already hired someone, they've gone through my vetting process, I probably feel pretty good about them. I know that they uh, have a certain skill set. If they've got that skill set to handle this other need that I have, why go outside? Now, you, of course, there may have to be some arrangements about hours and compensation and you know duties that someone else would would take care of, but you know, I always would want to look inside first if you've got a competent uh, person inside of your, your startup or your established company. Um, the bottom line is don't go outside if you don't have to. Now there are plenty of good reasons to go outside. New ideas, um, new energy, different skill set, but if all of those things are not necessarily relevant and you can tackle it with what you've got, I, I think that's something that you need to think about very seriously. So you've identified what it is you're trying to do, right? That was our first thing. Then we try to figure out, is it something that we can do inside? Then we got to find, uh, I'm sure everyone, well, probably no one in this room remembers Harry Truman, but I'm sure folks uh, remember studying him uh, at some point along in their schooling. So he was a uh, blunt spoke, uh, spoken president in the uh, uh, late 40s and uh, early 50s. And he had this saying, the buck stops here, because he got tired of, I think that's from uh, cards, where you would pass a buck if you didn't want to make a decision. Well, he said, you know, someone's got to make the decision. So in your organization, um, you need to identify the person who's going to be the point person, the contact person, the buck stopper, that's going to deal with, with the contract provider that you hire. This makes sense for a lot of reasons. 
Um, one, it's going to cut down on expense, particularly if you're talking about dealing with someone like a lawyer that charges by the hour, right? You don't want to have multiple points of contact because then you, you start to have multiple communications that this person is going to have to deal with and they'll charge you for. So money is, is always important. Then, perhaps more important is mixed messages. You don't want to have mixed or conflicting signals going to your to the person that you hire. You want to have one person that's speaking for the company when you deal with whoever you hire. So find out who's your, going to be um, your point of contact. Um, next, very important, and this is all part of establishing some basic financial controls for your your companies. So what's your budget? What do you intend to, what is it that you're, you know, we've already talked about what is it you're trying to do. So presumably you've already identified a budget for that. If not, um, then this will be the bucket of cold water in the face. How much are you planning to spend on this, this gentleman or this uh, lady that you're going to hire, this company that you're going to hire to, to outsource some something or provide some input to your company that you can't provide with existing resources? We need to identify that. Why is that important? You have a lot of C-suite experience. Why do you think that would be important, Dale? <clears throat> well, I can't imagine ever committing to any amount before <laughs> you know what the uh, uh, scope of the work is going to involve and, and the potential impact to my budget. Right. Because your budget is your, is your life, right? Yeah, budget is king. Because if you have something that eats up budget, then that means you got to chop other stuff out of the budget. Other stuff could be could be muscle or bone. Yeah, exactly. Um, all right, so a very little fat in most of my budgets. <laughs> exactly. I mean, most people who have, have been involved in in business for a period of time know what's important and what's not. It's not like you just got you know fleets of Cadillacs out there for you know people to drive around in. Um, so so you want to establish your budget for what you're trying to do, and then for the the personnel that you may be uh, contracting with. Then we come back to, to vetting, right? We talked about that, you know, don't vet someone if you don't have to. If you can hire someone from within, do that. So you go, we've made the decision to go outside. We've got a, uh, a budget established, so we've got some financial controls and we have some predictability. That's the other great thing about budgets, they give you predictability. And that's what, you know, outside investors uh, like, right? They want, most outside investors, I'm guessing, would like this to be a passive investment. They want to sit there and wait for checks to come in. They don't want to, some people want to get in and get involved, you know, drive, drive, drive it around a little bit themselves, but for the most part, you know, they're looking, and as, and as our startups, are looking for passive investment. So, so the great thing about the budget, and, and then we'll come back to the screen, the great thing about the budget that provides that predictability, that consistency that, that folks that want to be passive investors um, would like to see in a company. I mean, that is... When you think about business, you look for something that's consistent and predictable. When I'm a lawyer giving advice to a business client, they always want to know well, what's going to happen. I would like to know what's going to happen. It doesn't help to know what happened as much. It's better to know what's going to happen. So that's another reason the budgets are important. Uh, coming back to screening. So, so we need to identify some names. You know, don't go crazy. I don't feel like there's a magic number. There should be more than you know two or three, but less than I'd say less than ten. And then you want to find someone that can personally recommend the the company or the professional or the contractor you're going to use. Um, I'm sure that you can think of times in your life when you went to no one uses the phone book anymore. <laughs> went to the yellow pages. Now people go to you know the internet and. You don't usually find use the first name you find. You look for some sort of qualification. You know, does this person have the licensing that's required? Does this person have accreditation from agencies whom I respect? Does this person have um, qualification uh, merit um, awards? Um, as good as that is, you still, as a human being, I still feel like if my neighbor that I live next to has put a roof on his house and I see and he tells me, you know, it's never leaked, I'm probably going to value his opinion quite a bit. Same thing. I mean, don't necessarily go to your neighbor. I mean, unless your neighbor is in the field that you're trying to hire from. But go to someone that you trust, 
Um, it can be, you know, a, uh, an association of like-minded professionals. Um, but talk to folks that have had the same problem, figure out how they conquered it, figure out people that they use. That's how I would build my list. And that's how I do build my list um, when I have to, to hire out. Although, question for you on that. Yes, sir. Um, so oftentimes from a professional perspective, um, I often don't know if a contractor is coming in uh, who their other customers are, and oftentimes they could even be competitors of mine, which I may or may not have a relationship with. So oftentimes I have to ask the vendor, well, can you give me some references that I can call independently? But not this in, in that example, not dissimilar from um, Jane Doe, who's applying for a position at company at, at your at your sure. firm, and you say, "Oh, I have to have three professional references on you, Jane." And well, who's she going to give you? She's not going to give you the last company that she worked for, where she was fired because she was late to work consistently. Right. So any referenceability that an individual or a, or a vendor is going to give you, unless they're an idiot, they're going to give you somebody who they trust is going to give them a good reference. So how else besides that, other than using some of the quote unquote internet lists, the, the Angie list, the Angie's list of the world, which is great if you're having something done to your house, right. but if I'm dealing with a professional vendor that's not ranked on an Angie's list, right. how, how, what other methods could I use to confirm that referenceability? Well, I would, I would take, uh, you can kind of turn it on its head. You get some names, right? And, and maybe you don't have the ability to um, sort of pre-screen them through your you know, professional acquaintances and um, colleagues that, that you trust. So you get names the old-fashioned way, looking, not looking through the yellow page, but going on the internet, still building that list of names. And then you throw them at your professional colleagues. Hey, have you heard of this person? Anything good or bad? So you turn it around and use them as sort of as a post-screening, if you will. Okay. Uh, I would do that. And then another way that we do things, um, well, these are obvious, right? The search engines. Uh, go on court websites. You can go and you can find out if, you know, if they've sued or been sued. Now, of course, um, there's, no, there's no shame in suing or being sued. <laughs> <laughs> but you can find, you can sort of get a, you know, is it, is, it a, is it just a contract dispute or is there a claim that someone was untruthful? Or I mean, there's different kinds of lawsuits and different kinds of things. And in any case, once you, you find out about that, you can, you know, you can do more digging. I mean, this will lead to more digging. If it's someone that holds a license like a, uh, a contractor or a doctor or, you know, lawyers, I mean, many of Florida's professions are regulated by the, Divis the Department of Business and Professional Regulations. Um, lawyers are regulated by the Florida Bar, so you won't find their uh, credentials there, but you would find them on the Florida Bar's website. But, uh, most of the professionals uh, that have to be licensed by the state of Florida, um, you can find their license and their complaint history and their uh, other qualifications through this website. When you so, say court website, what's an example of some of the court Well, like in, in Lee, you can put in a Google, like, you know, Lee County Clerk of Court. Okay. And you can then, uh, there's a search uh, tool with, on the Clerk of Court's website and it allows you to put in, you know, names. So you can put in the, the person, last name of the person that you to hire. Okay. You can do that for most every county in Florida now. Yeah. Um, okay. you know, Miami Day. And the, and the federal court. And the, uh, thank you, Mark. Yeah, exactly. The federal court system. Okay. There's a, a, a it's called PACER, P-A-C-E-R. Um, and you just put PACER login into Google and um, you can go ahead and, and there's usually a, a charge. So we're already signed up, my office is, but you know, I think that a private person could go in there and do some searching after, you know, uh, entering a, a subscriber, you know, becoming a subscriber. I mean, these are not, yeah, not very burdensome on the um, person that's searching. It will, it will take some time to do it, but it's not going to cost you a fortune. Okay. Um, so once we've got our name, our initial round of names built, and we've screened them as best we can through, you know, professional colleagues, or an association, um, you know, we've gone through uh, what we feel is, is due diligence, then we want to interview them. Um, ideally, you'd be able to interview them in person. Um, that that's not, doesn't always happen. We don't live in Mayberry, so sometimes you have to, um, you know, phone, Skype. But there's something, again, I think in human nature, you want to know a little bit more about someone before just hiring them um, um, without, without talking to them. And so, 
ideally, again, you're going to provide them with exactly what you're trying to hire them to do. And then they have, you have to be careful if there's some you know, trade secret or confidential information, you're going to have to take appropriate steps to protect you when you disclose the information to this person or you would have to describe it in some general enough terms that you're not um, compromising your information. And we'll talk a little bit about that later, you know, non-disclosure agreements and things like that. But ideally, you know, you will have the person have an understanding of what it is that you propose to uh, hire them to do or contract out to do. You know, the, an, an example would be, you know, if you're hiring them to build an addition to your building. Nothing secret about that. Have them come out to your building, you know, walk around the site, get dirt on their shoes, ask them questions, you know. How long will this take? You know, how many people do you need to have on site? What's it going to do to my access? Um, what happens if, if we have uh, inclement, you know, uh, weather? What happens, what do you do in hurricane season? Um, you know, at the end of all of this, of course, you're going to ask them to give you something in writing. Uh, if they don't give you something in writing, I would think very hard about what it is that they propose to do in your relationship with them. Um, and so you do that with everyone. Then you go, and then you have a follow-up. Again, ideally, I, I think in person, but certainly by phone or Skype or you know whatever the circumstances permit and, and your comfort level is. Go back to you know this is where we met. This is what we discussed. This is what we intend to hire or, you know potentially hire you to do. You gave me a written bid. You know I have some follow up questions and then give them a deadline. You know that's important for for them and for you them because you know it shows that you mean business is important for you because it keeps the project rolling forward. Whoever your point person is, you know in addition to having a budget, you know the budget forms a control, but there's got to be a project timeline. If it doesn't if it's not moving along, then you know it's wasting. It's wasting. It's wasting money. It's wasting time, and you're not you're not getting to where you need to go. I mean, the point of hiring someone is to help you get the ball across the goal line, to speak in, in football terms. If you're not moving the ball toward the other team's end zone, then what are you doing? Um, questions. So far, so good. All of this, I, I think, is probably familiar to both of you, I'm guessing. Okay. So now we're, we're very close. As soon as the uh, symphony's done playing, we'll kind of go through how to bring it home. So not just pictures, but also sound. So we, um, so once you know you've satisfied yourself, this is someone that I can you know not only follow them up with, so to speak, as, as a contract provider. This is someone that I can live with and I trust, and it's going to get the job done for me. Then we got to memorialize it, um, which is the lawyer's way of saying you got to you got to have a written agreement, right? Um, these are obviously basics. You date and sign. You got to keep a copy of it. But the agreement is going to have, you know, Dale was talking at the very outset before we even, you know, started having our back and forth here about scope of work. I mean, that's so critical to have the scope of work. I mean, that is the contract. That's the meat of the contract. What are they going to do? You know, what are you going to do in return for what they do? It's got to be clearly defined. And you, you don't need to, it doesn't have to, you need to have someone that can help you put that together, whether, again, you have someone in-house or you have experience on your own or you have a lawyer that you can uh, trust that you've used before. The, the expense that you, a man, that you will end up paying um, uh, to have this properly documented is going to be far less than the risk of not having it properly documented if something goes wrong. Um, so you want to have um, in your agreement, probably depending on the nature of the work that's done, you're going to have a non-disclosure agreement, which means that the 
a person that's doing the work cannot talk about certain things. And you may also need to have a non-compete agreement, which means the person that is doing the work is not going to be able to go into business against you um, uh, for a certain time period in a certain geographic area. Um, and that's where you really want to have um, a, a, an attorney help you with that. Florida has a very specific statute on um, agreements in restrictive trade. That's the legislature's way of, of referring to a non-compete agreement. Uh, don't get it off the internet. I have I've seen what happens when you get something off the internet and it, the, the money that you think you're saving will be spent very rapidly in trying to make a bad situation um, workable um, using a, a, a document that's, that's just grabbed off the internet from someplace or that's homemade. Um, so th those are things that you really need to have um, good advice on. Um, and that's it. I mean, you then we go back to the idea of the point person is regularly monitoring, following up, you know, assisting with the with the completion of the project. Peter. So um, I always had this nightmare of all these very very long agreements and go through them and then you know understand them and then find the loopholes in them and all those things. Yes. So um, I mean, is is that possible to have a relatively short agreement and still a relatively tight agreement, really meaning that it protects you enough? Or if it protects you enough, it has to be very long? Um, that's such a, a good question. I mean, I think that you can get good protection in a short, I mean, that's short and long or relative terms. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, I always equate the seriousness, if you will, of a contract document with the seriousness of the project. I mean, if you have a $40 million project, you're going to put a lot of time into your contract rights that you, that you used to try to protect it. If this is a you know $10,000 project, you know you don't need to be that complicated. You know, um, but that's that's really a good the point. Complication and complexity not necessarily need to be the same. So just because something is complex doesn't need to be necessarily complicated. So a complex things may be put into a relatively uh, simple contract, but still providing protection, or that's just not possible. Well, and also a kind of an attached question to that one, uh, would you put everything into one contract, or maybe you know the non-disclosure, non-compete would be one, and then some of the scope of the work and another one, and so on and so forth. So maybe as you break them up, it's, it's easier to digest them, or you would just put everything into one contract. Well, what's, what's, what's the better? I don't know the, the answer to that because I've seen it both ways. Um, you know, I would probably at that point I say, look, Mark, I've got this client who's ready to go. He's got some serious questions about how do we how do we structure this? Are we going to have three agreements? Or are we going to have one? You know, I I like having one document that has everything in it. That's not always possible or practicable. Um, and I, you know, having litigated these, it, it almost doesn't matter. What matters more is what's in the document. When was it signed? How long does it, how long does it is it valid? And, and and you can have all of that in one document. You can have it in three documents. You know they're all signed the same day. But I, I don't know that that matters I mean, it, so it's, much it's, as long it's, as it covers it, everything. Breaking it up, it's more from the from my view, from I mean, the client's viewpoint. Because for me, it's maybe probably easier to digest. If I see a 40, 50 page document, right. immediately it's like, <sighs> how long it's gonna take for me to get through? If I see you know, three or four of these uh, five to 10 page max documents, maybe it's a, it's a little bit easier for me to get through. And I think that's a great question to work through when you, when you are, if you have an attorney and you say, look, you know, this is not a $40 million project. It is a, it's an important project to us, but I don't want it to be, uh, when we memorialize it, I don't want it to be so complicated and so complex that you know, my, my point guy who is not negotiating it can understand it and deal with interpreting it and keep my contractor on the line. So it's got to be you know, simple enough to be understood, but complex enough to cover everything. And, and so that's what you have to work through. Okay. Yeah, I, think, I think my practical example that I talked about earlier, 
you mentioned a, a good point, which is depends on the size of the deal, um, but it also depends on the volume of business over time that you may be doing with that particular vendor. I've been pretty successful with the with the philosophy, and I always describe it like a tree, basically. The, the root of your tree is always that NDA. I mean, the, the, the seed that's going in the ground is the NDA. From that blossoms a consulting agreement or, or a master services agreement, and that really has the bulk of your language in it that will cover you no matter what happens with the contract. And that, that does take a little bit more time that, that, because that is your, your, your thicker document. That's, you know, the old college kid who says, uh, well, based on the weight of this agreement, this feels like an A. <laughs> um, uh, and, and I'm sure lawyers do the same thing. Yeah. It just feels like about a ten thousand dollar contract. Yeah. Um, um, do you have a scale in your house? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then once you have the MSA in place, <clears throat> then to hang SOWs, statements of work or yeah. scope, off of that MSA becomes much more manageable for the individual, whether it's a client or the vendor, because then it really is a three to five page document that has a scope of work, basic terms and conditions about the about that scope of work, and then if God forbid anything goes wrong with, and I, I often use construction examples, so sure. you're building a house, yeah. and you have an SOW for the guy who's doing the driveway, the carpenter, the roofer, the landscaper, so if anything goes wrong with any one of those, they've all signed the same MSA, um, which is the, the cover for master document, but if something goes wrong, I, I don't have the roofer and the landscaper all having to go to court because the because the landscaper screwed up. Right. Um, so all I'm worried about is his SOW. Right. Um, and, and in IT, you know, it's the same difference. If I'm building a data center, I'm outsourcing one portion. The guy who's providing the hardware versus the guy who's running the cabling and fiber, two different scopes of work, covered by the same master agreement. Right. I, I've always found personal success in, in doing it that way. But there are, as you said. And maybe this is a one-off vendor. It's a ten thousand dollar piece of work. All I need is that I still need the NDA. I'm never going to do without the NDA. But um, but I can get away with just an NDA and an SOW that has all those other conditions in there, maybe dumbed down to right. a, to a simpler format. Yeah, but that's a great point. I mean, it, it certainly will depend on the nature of the job. As you said, is it a one-off? Is it something with OP serial or continuing work? Um, but, but the points that you raise are so important that, that you would definitely want to speak in, in, uh, to, your, to your lawyer or your contractor after and say, hey, look, you know, these are things I'm concerned about. You know, I, don't want a phone book, or I don't want a contract that looks like the you know, Miami-Dade County phone book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so things that you should just a couple, we're almost done here, but just a couple of parting thoughts that I want to leave you all. Things that you want to look for in a contract you know, that you'd be dealing with um, outside providers. You, know, you want to have... Uh, an integration or a merger clause, which basically says everything that we already discussed um, is disregarded and everything that we're agreeing on is within the four corners of this document. And we'll probably say it in a little bigger words and more convoluted lawyerly phrases, but that's basically what, what it means. Is everything we discussed beforehand doesn't matter. Whatever we agree on is what's the typewritten word in, in this document. So that's called a merger or integration clause. You'd want to, you know, make sure that that document or that paragraph or something like that is in there. You would probably also want to have a uh, prevailing party attorney's fee clause. That way, if uh, something goes wrong and you need to uh, hire an attorney to enforce your contract rights, then um, uh, if you prevail, uh, and hopefully you will. <laughs> you would uh, then be able to use that as leverage uh, in negotiations and ultimately uh, potentially get a judgment for attorney's fees and costs if you're troubled having to enforce the contract. So that's something you would want. You would also probably want to have a venue and jurisdiction clause, um, which would say, you know, where is this going to be fought out? Would it be, you know, you when you rent a car, it, you know, if you have a dispute, you, sometimes you got to go to Seattle. Well, you know, I'm in Fort Myers. I guess I'll just, you know, pay this. I'm, I'm not going to go to Seattle and hire a lawyer there. So you will want to have your contract say, you know, that the venue and jurisdiction would be, you know, the courts of, of uh, competent jurisdiction in, in Lee County, Florida, in Lee County, Florida. Um, uh, so we talked about prevailing party. We talked about a merger clause. We talked about a... Um, venue and jurisdiction clause, you'd probably also want to look for a no oral modification clause. Basically, it's going to say that the only way that this agreement is amended is if um, it's signed by all of the parties uh, uh, here too. 
there are exceptions to that, and we're not going to get into that because it's not supposed to be a, a contract uh, law class, but the best protection is to have that in there and, and then make sure that it's followed. If you're going to change the agreement, don't just say, well, we're going to start doing it this way from now on and not document it as required. You've got to follow the contract. That's your, your, your rule book now. Uh, and if you deviate from the rule book, it's held against you. You know, you may say in the contract that we're not going to have any oral modifications, but if you do start modifying it orally and both parties start acting out on the oral modification, then that, that language that says we can only modify it by writing won't count. And so you need to make sure, as I said, follow it because it's your rule book. I think that you'll have great success if you follow, I mean, these are very kind of basic and general principles. I didn't want to get very specific um, other than, you know, I've given you some kind of keys to take away and look for in contracts. Um, but I, I hope that you find um, that these uh, things will help you out as you're getting your project off the ground, you know. Identify exactly what you want to do, you know, define that scope of work, figure out can I satisfy it from inside my office. If not, then we go ahead and we screen candidates, run them through the search engines, run them through the license website, you know, talk to professionals in your field that may have had the same problem. You know, do the personal interviews, have them come walk around the site, come into your building, see what they need to install, or, or um, then come back, get that written bid from them, and make sure that they understand exactly this, what you want them to do, and then get it memorialized, and, and then happy success. I think things will work. And if they don't work out, then you're in the best position to protect yourself. Again, as we talked about, it's like a cold. You can do your best to minimize the risk of that, but sometimes you may have to deal with a real estate realm. Maybe someone who's not that interested in getting into all these details. They'll actually come and do a good job based on references you know and you've seen their work. And sure. You start mentioning this, their eyes are going to glaze over and they're just, you know, they're going to be the best value, the best price. You can get this from someone, I can guarantee you it, but, uh, you know, for instance, on Marco Island, it might cost you a fortune. <laughs> to get someone who's going to sit down and iron all this stuff with you, so and that goes got to be to the volume yep. and scope yes. of future work. Yeah, you know. absolutely, absolutely, and, and that's where you have to use your judgment as a business person. You know, is this the sort of project where my, you know, I've done my homework and I feel I can trust this person? Am I willing to risk it? And you know, as big boys and big girls, you know, we know when we can take risks. Sometimes, most of the time, we're right. Sometimes we might be wrong. I mean, I, I like the cobblers kids sometimes don't have the best shoes. I have definitely got into agreements without having a perfect written contract, but I've done my homework in advance and I figured, okay, this is a risk that I can take. I can live with this risk. If you don't evaluate, then it's not risk, it's just reckless.